So uh, this is the part two of the three C's and three E uh, that uh, I did probably three weeks ago. Okay, so if you look at this chair, you would know what it means. Okay, so this is the first C uh, that we saw. Uh, do you remember what's that? Yes, first C is the C of complacency. And we looked at the life of Eli and uh, we learned quite a bit from his life. And this morning, we're going to be looking quite a bit. Uh, we're going to be looking at C2, C3, and then E1, E2, and E3. So let's, let me not waste a lot of time. Let me get right into the, um, the topic. Yeah, this is a true story I read somewhere. And this is about a pastor who fell in love with his secretary and he wanted to get married to her. Okay, level one. Then both the pastor and the secretary, they plan to murder their spouses. Level two. And how they go about doing this is that this pastor disguises himself as a robber. He goes to the house of the secretary or husband and he shoots him in the presence of his children. Level three. And later, the secretary and the pastor are planning to go to another state and start a counseling ministry. Whenever you hear Christians uh, who get into, uh, who fall into gross sin, you wonder, what did they ever get to do so that they can go to such a low level? Probably if they were not believers, then it's okay, but they are believers. And then you wonder how could they give themselves to such unimaginable uh, sin. And uh, if you take a closer look at their lives, their lives would be an example of total compromise. I'm not talking about the Swalpa Ajismadi. That's very common in Karnataka, Canada, right? Anything in traffic you want to get through, you say, Salpa, just muddy, sir. Probably in marriage, give and take. I'm not talking about that. This is C2. It's, the, it's compromise. Compromise of morals, compromising ethics, compromising integrity, compromising God's word, God's standards for your life. So I wanted you all to look at this picture. It's a picture of a leaky roof. And if this leaky roof is going to be left unattended, I'm sure the house is going to collapse. True? That's how compromise is to our life. First C is complacency, where there's an easy chair mentality. From there, if you don't attend to it, you can move to C2, which is compromise. Altering your life to accommodate others or other things in your life. Altering your life to accommodate others or other things in your life is compromise. So there's another picture coming up, and I want you all to identify who this person, who's the person who built this uh, whatever you see in the picture. This is the glorious temple that was built by King Solomon. Wow, well, you got that right. For life for Solomon came very easy. He didn't go about fighting big battles. It came on a, a platter for him. His father, out of his uh, illegitimate relationship with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, even though Solomon was born out of that, God was merciful, God saw David's heart, and God chose Solomon to be the successor of David. Solomon was only 20 years when he became the king, very young king, and uh, when David was about to die, David gave a manual to Solomon. That's the word of God, the prescription. The mandate, this, these are the stuff that you need to follow in your life so that you are able to move on. It's like he handed over a baton. We are all in a relay and we are handing it over to our next generation. Probably if you are running a business, 
sooner or later, you're a parent, sooner or later, every stage of our life, we have a baton. And so David handed over that baton to Solomon. And this is what David uh, uh, said to Solomon in 1 Kings 2, 2 to 5. I am about to go the way of all the earth, David said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him. Not just the word, but you obey the word. Put the word to practice and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. The Lord had promised to David and David is communicating that he's passing it on to, your, uh, to Solomon. He's saying, if your descendants watch how they live. If your descendants Watch how they live. There's a message coming out for each one of us. We need to watch how we live. And so that's what David said. If, if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on Israel. So a clear commandment David offers to Solomon. And Solomon starts off really well. Then David rested with his ancestors. This is from 1 Kings chapter 2, 10 to 12. And was buried in the city of David. He had reigned 40 years over Israel, uh, 7 years in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his rule was firmly established. So in the place of David, Solomon became the king. He was now stepping into some big standards. And because he's 20 years, he humbles himself before God. He goes to this altar that's in Gibeon, and he offers a huge sacrifice. There's a video, a short video for you to just get a glimpse of how it was then, just to get an idea. We'll watch that video. Solomon goes there and offers sacrifice. That was Solomon's request. Solomon offered that sacrifice. God was pleased with Solomon. And God said, I will give it to you. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 3 to 7, it says, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in the place of my father David. But I am only a child and do not know how to carry this duty. That's what he said in the video. A total dependence on God. He did not ask for riches. He did not ask for power, wealth, possession, nothing. He just asked for wisdom. And God gives wisdom to Solomon. And Solomon's wisdom is incomparable. He's the wisest man who ever lived on the planet Earth. And you see how Solomon, after that, goes about doing amazing things. And Solomon only asked for wisdom. I think this is loud. Could you reduce it, please? <clears throat> yeah. So Solomon asked for wisdom, but what did God give him? God gave him more than that. God gave him riches, wealth, life, honor, everything. And you see how Solomon constructed that beautiful temple. It took 20 years for Solomon to do that, according to all the prescriptions. And Solomon was the author and composer, the, the Proverbs, the Songs of Songs of Solomon. Everything is written by him. He was an administrator and architect. He was a diplomat and a businessman, making alleys and trades with the neighboring countries. So everything that he had was everything God had given him. Slowly, we see a kind of erosion in Solomon's life. Often, God takes us through two schools. That, that's what I've heard. It's a school of suffering and a school of success. When we go through the school of suffering, all we have in our life is only God. And it draws, close, it draws us closer to God. It kind of shapes us, builds us, matures us. But post that, when you go through the school of success, we kind of 
become a little overconfident. We start depending on ourselves. And the worst goes, pride comes before the fall, a haughty spirit before destruction. That became a reality in Solomon's life. His success kind of blinded him and uh, he started losing momentum in his life. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 to 11 says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind is still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their life. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves to flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and I had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and the provinces. I acquired greater by far anyone. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward of all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hand had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. I hope you got the picture. He indulged in every form of indulgence you can think of. There was women in his life. There was wealth in his life. There was wine in his life. The three W's. And starting off that way, Solomon Lord's focus on God and he became a soulish man. Whatever he thought, whatever he saw, whatever he felt, he went about fulfilling his desire. And in his prosperity, he started forgetting God. He started sinning against God. So with wisdom came success and riches and honor and complacency and slow compromise. Solomon just sat there enjoying every pleasure of life and he gave himself to compromise. Altering his life to accommodate others and other things. And his life started to plateau. What are some of the compromises that Solomon gave himself to? You read their passage? That's going to be looking. He made some unwise alliances with unbelievers. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 to 11, clearly God gives them a mandate. You're not supposed to make alliance with other kings. Do not marry them. Do not amass a lot of silver and gold. Don't have a huge army because you will start depending on them and you will start to forget. So that's what exactly Solomon did. Unwise alliances with unbelievers. 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 1. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building this palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. So when Solomon started building the temple, simultaneously, the Bible records, he was building a palace. If you read it. Because he pre-planned that when he goes to get married to Pharaoh's daughter, he will bring her to this new palace that he's built, not into the palace of his father David. You can read through the scriptures yourself. So simultaneously, both came up. He, he uh, inaugurated the temple, and then he got married, and he brought her. And it was not about a king marrying a 
Pharaoh's daughter meant it's two nations coming together. It's not just two people. With that came the culture, the idolatry, every form of ungodliness into Israel. The second thing, unrestrained preoccupation with sex. He made alliances, then he had an appetite, an unrestrained appetite for sex. 1 Kings chapter 11, 1 to 3 says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. So he got married. There were more than one. And all of them are women who are not from Israel. They are from pagan countries who do not worship the Lord. And so what happens? They were from the Moabites, the Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He began to love these women in his life more than God. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. That's quite a huge number. Can you imagine? Someone says that probably the uniform started then because so many wives and so many children, which one, to whom, what, and then they made uniform. This one. It's bizarre. And the Bible records clearly God told not to do, Solomon went about doing. And the third compromise is unholy involvement in idolatry. First is an alliance, second is, ma second is uh, with sex, third is with idolatry. 1 Kings 11, 4 to 8. As Solomon grew old, his wife turned his heart after other gods. God had promised him. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord as God. He started off really well. He said, Lord, I can't handle this. I need your help. Now his heart is turned away from God. And his heart of David, his father, he followed Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians. I feel like wiping my eyes and looking, reading it again. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? The man who went and offered that sacrifice to whom God appeared, God gave all wisdom, goes and now he builds a temple. He followed Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So he constructed high places and he encouraged idolatry. Are you seeing one thing leading to another? From complacency... Solomon moves to compromise. Little by little, compromising. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all the foreign wives. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. So he allowed, he was worshipping God, but he, he also allowed. And the last thing is that he kind of amassed so much of wealth that God did not tell him to do. And his wealth and the army and all that kind of brought him to ruins. There was, he became so self-sufficient, self-confident, Self-indulgent, self-centered, and eventually he became rebellious and disobedient to God. One thing leading to another. So from compromise, he led the whole of Israel and his life into captivity. Your C3 is captivity. If you're not looking into comp complacency in your life, those little foxes, a little bit of yeast you will give in to compromise. And if you're not going to look into that, you and your generation will go into captivity. What is captivity? A total imprisonment. A complete bondage. Enslavement. That's what captivity means. 
There's a quote that says, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And even before God could remove the protection and bring about a judgment, God warned Solomon thrice. Can you turn to your neighbor and say thrice? Okay. The first thing is that God appeared to him in the dream and he told him, don't do this. The second time, after Solomon constructs a, constructs a temple, the glory of the Lord descends and God speaks to him. Look at 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 1 to 9. I'm just going to run through uh, uh, only those important verses. The Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you've made before me. I've consecrated this temple which you built. This is after Solomon built the temple. By putting my name there forever, my eyes and my heart will always be there. 1 Kings 9.4 as for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, and as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, but if you and your descendants turn away from me. So in a sense that God knew something is, gonna, is happening in Solomon's heart. And God's caution is a little severe. He says, walk before me with all integrity, but... If you, do, if you don't do this, this is going to be the consequences of that. Okay. And the third time, 1 Kings 11, 9 says, The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. So this is the third time. And this is what the Lord tells Solomon. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, this is the third time God is telling, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my command, covenants and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I love this. Every time God is promising a blessing, every time God is giving him a warning, he's referring David. Because David left a godly legacy for Solomon. You have a choice. Whatever you're right. The best gift you can give to your family is not money, it's not wealth, not education, it's your righteous life. Amen, church? You believe in that? That's the best gift you can leave behind. More than the inheritance, more than anything else. And that's, what, that's why God's referring David again and again. Solomon, your father was like this, but you're not. So, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son, yet I will not tear the whole kingdom for him, but I will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. The Bible records some response after this third appearance of God. Solomon went and sent away all those 700 wives to their own homes. He told the 300 concubines, please leave me. I want to serve the Lord. He brought down all the high places. He destroyed everything. He sent off all the horses, chariots, army. He destroyed. He said, I'm going to wholeheartedly trust in the Lord. The Bible doesn't record anything of that sort. Solomon just, Solomon just sat there and did nothing about it. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Both in the, in the book of Kings... And Chronicles, it doesn't say anything about his repentance. Probably later in Ecclesiastes, he comes to his senses. But that's his response. So from complacency, you move to compromise. From compromise, you move to captivity. C.S. Lewis says this. Indeed, the fastest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Very gentle, very comfortable, very convenient, how nice. And as a result of Solomon's compromise, the entire nation falls into captivity. God raises up an adversary for Solomon, Hadad the Edomite, to fight against Israel. 
God raises Rezon, a son of Elida. Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, rebels against Solomon. He was one of Solomon's officials. You can go and read that in Chronicles and King. Israel rebels against Rehoboam. The 12 tribes are now divided into two, the northern and the southern. The two tribes are now with Solomon. The 10 tribes are given to one of Solomon's official, Jeroboam. And Jeroboam, Jeroboam builds golden calves of, uh, at Bethel and Dan because the temple is in the south. The 10 tribes are in the north. And Jeroboam thought if they're going to go offer worship in south, they're going to go back so he built idols for people to worship there itself. Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. Jeroboam led Israel astray by giving them to idolatry. All the ten tribes went into idolatry. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, was the king of Judah. 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 21 to 24. Jeroboam, son of Solomon, was king in Judah. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen out of the tribes of Israel in which he put his name. Okay? Yeah. His mother was Nama. She was an Ammonite. Now, the Bible refers the two tribes as Judah. Judah and only Benjamin are there in the southern. Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up jealous anger more than those who were before them, uh, them had done. They built, they also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones, and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. They not only built, they went under the tree and they made idols. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. That's total depravity. They were not only concubines and loads of wives in Solomon's harem. Now there are male prostitutes in the temples. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before Israelites. Who brought them in to Israel? Who made alliances? That's the baton Solomon had to hand over to his next generation. It was fully smeared with adultery, idolatry, and every form of filth and immorality. Solomon handed it over to his next generation, and the next generation brought it to complete ruins. The entire nation is divided. People come and capture. Eventually, the temple is burnt, broken. And during the, during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylon king, the entire temple is destroyed. Israel is captured. They are all sent off as exiles. Complacency to compromise to captivity. You can look at that This happened in Solomon's life, and the Bible says these are examples for us not to follow. These are warnings for us. That's what we saw last uh, Sunday, the time when I did. How do we overcome this? How do you overcome the three C's in your life? It's very simple. Can you turn to your neighbor and say it's very simple? Keep the basics right. Get the basics right. Get the foundations right. You go to any seminar, any prayer meeting, anywhere, they will teach you this thing. Your time with the Lord. Your devotional life. Deuteronomy 17, 18 to 19 says, And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the day of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord. That was a mandate. Every king would have a copy of the Bible, if I have to say now, and they are supposed to read it every day, so that they will walk in the fear of the Lord. 
Okay? Learn to fear the Lord by is God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. So a king was supposed to be a regular reader of God's word. And he was supposed to pass it on to the next generation. Not just read, but obey his word. We see a great example in the Bible. Joshua 1.8. A very common uh, verse we use. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Whose words are these? Moses spoke to Joshua before he died. Moses handed over a baton to Joshua. And what is the foundational truth of that, whatever he handed over? The word of God. Not just read it, meditate, and you make a commitment to obeying the word of the Lord. And Joshua lived for 110 years. Okay? And in Joshua 23, 6 and 7, this is what Joshua says. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. So what did Joshua do? He lived his life. And he's now handing over the baton to the next generation. And what does that say? Obey God's law. Obey God's word. Read God's word. Meditate on God's word. And he hands it over. Joshua was successfully able to hand it over to the next generation. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that's written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left and lest you may go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them above them. Joshua took God's word seriously. Amen? We see that. And so how can we apply this to our life? You move from this chair of complacency. You get up. Psalm 1, you stand. You sit, you stand, and you walk. Do not do that. And what you do, you go and you find the throne room of God. This represents the throne room of God. This is your secret place. Where you find answers to all the challenges, all the struggles, whatever you need, it's all there in God's presence. That's the secret. And so, the way you move forward from this 3C is moving to the first E. That is the eternal word of God. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, the eternal word of God. Can you repeat that again? It's very important. The eternal word of God. So you, you, you don't stand, you don't sit, you don't walk, but you move away. And what you do, you, Psalm 1, 2 and 3 says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. David made his delight to be in the, Lord of, in the, in the law of the Lord. Joshua made it his delight to, to follow the law of the Lord. And if you make your delight to read his word, to obey, to meditate and follow there is a blessing upon your life. Amen? There is a blessing. This is very simple truth. This is foundational. Sometimes it's so simple, it becomes so difficult. We don't get the basics. If you don't get the basics right, like I'm teaching maths to my little girl, her tables are okay. Okay, not that great. And so we are going back to the basics because if she's not going to get the tables right, multiplication and division is going to be very hard. And later, she's going to struggle as she goes to higher classes. Similarly, if you don't get your basics right, you will always come down. That's why they give us tests in, in our schools to promote us. So we need to get our basics right. Making the word of the Lord your delight is the key to overcome every form of complacency. It's all there in the word. Go back to the word. The word and Jesus cannot be separated. 
Amen? If you say you love the Lord, then you will read the word. And if you say, if you're reading the word, then you will love the Lord. And if you're obeying God's word, you are obeying God's law. God. And if you're obeying God, you are obeying his word. The word and God are together. And that's why it's so important for us to plug in to the source. Plug in to the source. Because that's where you receive every unlimited resource of God, his love, his grace, his provision, his victory. So do not compromise going to the throne room of God and enjoying the time every day. Every day, don't compromise. Don't let anything come in the way. You will have loads of distraction. We all have been there. Sometimes we have our phones, smartphones, we have WhatsApp, we have Facebook, everything online, and everything keeps popping. You need to take responsibility. We need to be diligent, and you start working on those ways. What you value, you will make time. Amen? What you value, you will make time. You value God, so this morning you are here. You value your children, so you take them on holidays, you spend time with them. What you value, you make time for that. So you value God, you value that time with Him every day, because that's what is going to give you spiritual food. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever and ever. Our supernatural birth itself is in the word of God. You're born of the word and the spirit. 1 Peter 2.22 says, As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow. Your spiritual growth is in the word of the Lord. Amen? Your spiritual growth is in the word of the Lord. And 1 James 1.21 says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. What will save your souls? The word of God from all those three C's. I'll share my testimony. In 2010, in one of the, the services that I was sitting, God prompted and he, he kind of put a desire in my heart to have my morning devotions very disciplined. My children would go to school by 7, so Beth woke up at 6.30 and there's loads of noise in the kitchen. You know people who have children, okay? So I would wake up in the morning I will have my time reading, praying and all. But my cutoff time was 6.45. So if I woke up at 5, 6.45 is okay. But if I woke up at 6, it was not enough time. And so I was not diligent in waking up early. And therefore, I wanted to teach myself a lesson. It's a good thing, actually. Okay. So what I did, I put a plan together and I said, Lord, I want to discipline my spiritual life because I know every answer, everything is in this. And so I put a certain time and I said, whether I sleep at 11 or I sleep at 9 or whatever time, I'm going to wake up at this time because this is the most important thing in my life. Okay, first day I got up, I struggled through it a little bit because I slept late. The second day I got up, I finished one week. It was a struggle. It was a little challenge. At the end of the week, I put a star in my Excel sheet. And I said, well done, Charles. Excellent. You've come one week. People say 21 days, you make a habit, it becomes okay, whatever. But I prayed and I trusted in the Lord. Week two went by. Week three went by. My body became so used to it. Whether I sleep at whatever time, at five I'm awake, wide awake. How did it happen? It's not a gradual thing. You just don't leave it as it is. You make a growth plan, a personal revival plan for your life. I'm sure God has spoken certain things that you've been complacent, you've been compromising. Make a growth plan. And that's how I did. And it's not a struggle. It's been quite a few years now. And Life is going on. God, is, God speaks to me in the morning. That's the most important time for me. And I can't live this life without that. It's the most important thing. The most. The second thing. 
I was tormented with sexual thoughts. I lived in sexual bondage for 29 years of my life. And when I was 29, I came for the encounter weekend. God set me free. God liberated. God deliver, uh, delivered me. That was day one. But I had so many years to walk by. What kept me going is the word of God. Pastor Victor taught us to, if there's any sin in your life, this is how we've been taught to pray. Lord, put a hatred and a disgust for the sin in my life. Write it down. It's very important. Lord, put a hatred, Lord. This is ungodly. I don't want to do it. Help me, Lord. So I prayed that. And what I did, I took the word of God. We were doing this tabernacle study. It says that the word of God is like the basin of labor where the priest would come, offer the sacrifice, they go to the basin of labor, they wash themselves of all the filth. That's what the word does to us. And so mine was filled with all the spirit. I would read and I would believe. I would read and I would believe and I would say, there was a prayer about the mind. I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ to be able to comprehend God's, God's plan for my life that gives life and spirit and all those verses I would just memorize and believe. From that day, 2006 till now, I've not gone back to any of those old patterns of my life. I have a clean mind, the mind of Christ. Where did it start? It all starts with a deep desire that God puts in our heart, we can't do it again, but you take responsibility. Our life, our Christian life is called a Christian walk. You take a step, God takes another step. He tells you something, you obey, then he tells you. The things that God has revealed to you, if you're not obedient, he's not going to give you more revelations. Are you getting that? God tells very clearly, do not lie. It's, it's, it's in, in, in the open. If you're not following those things, he's not going to give you more revelation, more things, because the basics are not in place. So that's how I started moving. And that's how the eternal word of God became my delight. And the eternal word of God can become your delight. We go to God not out of guilt. You don't wake up in the morning and say, Oh Lord, you're going to punish me. You're going to do this. I need this. No, not that. You go to God for comfort. You don't go to God for guilt. You go to God for comfort. It's fellowshipping with Him. You enjoy His presence. Sometimes you might sleep, you might miss that time, no problem. It's a relationship. In this, in this relationship, who is the faithful one? He is the faithful one. So I don't have to worry. I take it easy. And I found the greatest joy in spending time. The glorious moments of your life is the private time you spend with God. Not corporate. It's, that's the time God speaks to you. That's when you, you feed your spirit and you grow. And that is the plan David had. Psalms 119.9 says, How can a young man cleanse his ways? By keeping, by, by taking heed according to the word of God. That kept, kept David going. David was able to guard his life with the word of God. I have stored up your word in my heart so that I might not sin. Someone said this, we all have a spiritual library. What is it called? Spiritual library. Whatever you read is stored up right in that spiritual library. Okay? So it could be spiritual stuff or, or different thing. At the right time, God will bring out those words to fight against the enemy or to speak to a situation. How much is stored in your spiritual library? D.L. Modi says, sin will keep you away from the word or the word of God will keep you away from sin. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is the discerner of thoughts and intents of our heart. The word of God is able to divide between the, what, that's coming from the soul and that's coming from the spirit. How did Jesus overcome temptation? Through the word of God. So, the first E, can you tell me what that is? 
the eternal word of god the second e is having an eternal perspective can you turn to your neighbor and say eternal perspective yeah eternal perspective means your attitude as to change when we live with this eternal perspective we will live careful and meaningful lives we will be aware of our final destiny our destination 1 corinthians sorry colossians 3 1 2 3 says if then you were raised with christ seek those things which are above where christ is sitting at the right hand of god set your mind on things above not on the things of the earth we are so earthly minded sometimes everything about our lives is what we see we want we, we want to feel it it's all in the natural the bible is kind of shaking that and saying set your mind on things that are above on eternal things which has eternal value and purpose for your life second corinthians 4:18 while we do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary while the things which are not seen are eternal there is a spiritual reality and we need to ask the lord to open our eyes to this someone said you are so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good have you heard that i'm going to reverse that we are so heavenly minded that we are of great earthly use amen you believe in that can you say that with me we are so heavenly minded that we are of great earthly use look let's look at this video i'm sure this video will encourage you and then we will close i don't know what job you do what struggles you going through but the truth is you are the hands and the feet of jesus we are the body of christ and so when we have this eternal perspective to our life then we will start becoming kingdom builders we are not building our kingdom we are there to build god's kingdom it's a mind shift keeping the end in mind that's what cs lewis says if you read history you will find that the christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next the generation that's going to come after you everything that you have belongs to god including your jewels that you're wearing and the money in your wallet it's not yours it belongs to the lord and you are only a steward what does a steward do in a hotel does he cook he takes it from there serves to the people and that's our job he's given it to us we serve it and at the end we have to give an account to our master we are in this world but we are not of this world that is an eternal perspective a mind shift and attitude so let's recap what's the first e the eternal word of god your time with the lord the second is having an eternal perspective the third one is eternal judgment don't worry it's not scary if you close your eyes here in heaven you will open your eyes sorry if you close your eyes you'll open it in heaven it's that's it understanding eternal judgment will keep you from complacency there is no neutral ground in god's kingdom if you agree can you say an amen to me there's no neutral ground there are only two kingdoms the kingdom of god the kingdom of darkness and you see this trail throughout the bible there's light there's darkness there's blessings there's curses there's life there's death there's god and false gods and idols you are either hot or you're cold there's no middle ground there's no middle ground that's why ecclesiastes 11:9 says rejoice o young man in your youth and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes but know 
that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. You are answerable. We are answerable how we live. Not to scare us, but to make us more responsible and to make us more humble. Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. This is the judgment of how we lived our life here. It's not the judgment of punishment where you're going to be sent to hell. No, we all are going to make it to heaven. Can you wave your hands and say amen to me? Amen, yes. But when we stand before the throne, how we lived our life, God is going to reward us. And that's what motivates us every day. There's going to be crowns given to us. Amen? And so that is the motivation for us. 2 Corinthians 5.10 We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive his due for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. God wants to reward us. Let's do a little introspection this morning. Have you given yourself to those three things in your life? Probably there's a sense of complacency in any, in any area of your life, or you've compromised on certain things, or you're already in captivity or in bondage to some things in your life. How is your time with the Lord, or how are you living your life? Are you living for today, or is there that eternal perspective to the way you live? This morning, even as you realign your life, the Bible gives us a promise that you will be like a tree planted by the streams of waters, bearing fruit in season, evergreen. Replace these three seas with these three E's. You are on the pathway to uh, God's faithfulness in your life. And even as you do the replacement, one hand you have C, one hand you have the E's. Even as you realign it, the Bible says, but the path of the righteous is like the shining, shining sun that shines even brighter unto the perfect day. Your life will begin to shine brighter and brighter even to the end. We'll take a moment and ask the Lord, you have a baton in your hand. You need to hand it over to your generation. You can ask the Lord if there are things you can bring it before him and realign and get your heart right before him. Let's pray. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, forget that all is goodness. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, sing. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that